Well, good morning. I want to welcome each and every one of you to Faith Lutheran Church this morning, whether you are here in person or joining us online. It is a joy and privilege to be talking with you this morning. This is normally the point in our worship service where we would collect our gifts and tithes to the Lord, and given the times that we're in, we're just kind of giving you the opportunity to drop those in a basket by the door on your way out. But we did want to take just a moment to give you an update on at least one of the things that we're doing as a congregation, and, and um, that is that using the, um, the, the gifts of time and service uh, that each and every one of you so generously bring to the congregation, um, we are uh, continuing to work with our ministry partners in the community during this time, and um, it's no secret uh, that the people in Texas are really hurting right now, and one of our ministry partners at Wood Midwest Food Bank has been called uh, by the Salvation Army and asked, um, hey, would you mind shipping 10 semi-truckloads of food down here to Texas? And um, as Midwest Food Bank always does, they're like, sure, no problem. Um, don't know where the food's coming from and don't know how we're going to get that loaded up, but yes, we will absolutely do that. And so uh, this afternoon, just wanted to let you know that we've got a bunch of our um, uh, our youth uh, and some adults going over to Midwest Food Bank and, and packing things up. And, and this particular group that's going over there this afternoon um, is kind of full. They're kind of limiting the number of people that they can work on these groups simultaneously. But um, there's always a need at Midwest Food Bank for volunteers. And so whether we have a group going over as a church or um, you just want to take the opportunity to go to their website and, um, and sign up, uh, there's always an opportunity to serve and, and the need just never stops, um, and it seems like it no, no sooner gets quiet than then something fires up again. So we, um, we are just always very grateful for our partnership with Midwest Food Bank and the opportunity to serve there, and we're very, very grateful uh, for those of you who contribute to the ministries of Faith, Truth, and Church. As you were here uh, this morning or you joining us online, you have the opportunity also to give online, and uh, we just want to continue to build God's kingdom and spread the word and the love of Jesus Christ in any way that we can. So I just wanted to give you an update on that in lieu of this time of offering this morning. So as I mentioned before, my name is John Petrillo. I'm one of the lay worship leaders here at Faith Lutheran Church. Um, and uh, today, if you've got your Bible with you, um, if you want to turn to the book of Malachi, um, that'll be uh, part of our sermon message this morning. We're going to bounce around a little bit, but we're going to hit on the message from the book of Malachi. And if you're not familiar with Malachi, it is actually the last book in the Old Testament. So go ahead and flip over to Matthew, which is where we always know where that is, because that's the first book in the New Testament, and then flip back a couple of pages, and you'll be exactly where you need to be as we go through our sermon message this morning. And today we're continuing our sermon series, as Jeff mentioned, called Long Story Short. And for the first 12 weeks of 2021, we are providing an overview of the Bible, the narrative from Genesis all the way through to Revelation. Now, the Bible contains 66 books in total, and we really want everybody to not just read, but study each of the books of the Bible, and that's why we're doing a one-year Bible study here as a congregation, and, and so we, um, we pray that you are uh, enjoying that and working through that with us as a congregation. Um, but we want you to get through everything, but for these 12 weeks, we're just going to hit the highlights, the main themes of the biblical story. And one of the things that we want to touch on about the Bible, that it's not just a story about God, but it's actually a tool that God uses to reveal himself to us, to reveal his character to us through the lives of the people that are represented in the story. And this is called progressive revelation. God gradually reveals more and more to us as we continue to dig into the Bible. And as each week of our study and in each book of the Bible that we go through in the Old Testament, we continue to learn more and more about who God is. And for those of you who are visiting us today, or maybe you've missed a couple of sermons over the last couple of weeks, these are all online on our church website, and we highly encourage you to go out there and pay that a visit and pull those down and catch up. But given that today is the last part of the series of the Old Testament, we're going to do a little bit of a recap for you, okay? So we've got some time today. We'll spend about the day, and we'll get through the Old Testament from beginning to end before this is over with. 
okay? That was a joke. I see a lot of nervous faces out there. I'm kidding. It'll really only take about two hours. It won't take the whole day, but we're going to get through this, okay? But before we do that, please join me in a quick word of prayer. Father in heaven, we give you thanks for revealing yourself to us through the gift of your holy word. And as we learn more about you this morning, we pray, dear Lord, that the words that I speak and the meditations on all of our hearts will be true to your word and bring honor and glory to you and help us gain a better understanding of you and your will for our lives. In Jesus' name, amen. On April 1st, 1976, three men from Palo Alto, California, formed a handshake agreement to form a business agreement to sell computers. Now, the computer that they were selling, we've got a picture of it up here, was groundbreaking. It had an integrated four kilobytes of RAM. Four kilobytes of RAM. Not a megabyte of RAM, not a gigabyte of RAM, a kilobyte of RAM. And it also had some external ports on it so that you can plug in a keyboard or maybe a computer monitor or even a cassette deck that you could use to store data on. A cassette recorder. Remember those cassette recorders? This is not a picture of the inside of the computer. This is the computer. This is what you got. It sold for $700. And at the time, it was pretty groundbreaking. Now, one of the three men changed his mind and said, I don't like the idea of this anymore. I want out. So within the first two weeks of starting the company, he actually sold his shares of the company back to the two other founding members of the company. Their names were Steve Jobs and Steve Wozniak. Now, he sold his share of the company back to them for $800 and thought he was doing good to get out before losing anything. The name of the company that Steve Jobs and Steve Wozniak and this other person who decided to bail is, of course, Apple, right? And the product that they were selling, and we've got one more picture on that, is the Apple, t Apple One. So this was the sales flyer for the Apple One, laying out all the advantages of having this thing. It's pretty sparse. There's not a whole lot there. Now, the company grew pretty quickly, though. This was pretty groundbreaking at the time, and it sold pretty quickly. And pretty soon, the Apple I was superseded by the Apple II, which we also have a picture of. Now, the Apple II was even more brown, groundbreaking because it actually had a keyboard and it had a case. So we were really moving in the right direction. And soon, the Apple II became the standard platform for a new software package called VisiCalc, which was, was the first spreadsheet application available for a personal computer. So we're really going back in time. By the end of 1980, the Apple Computer Company, their revenues had grown from $775,000 to $118 million a year in just four years. That's a 533% annual sales growth rate for those of you who like the math. They did pretty well. And on December 12th of 1980, the Apple Computer Company went public. And at the end of that first day of trading, over 300 millionaires had been created by the sale of Apple stock, and the company had a market capitalization of $1.78 billion. Now, Apple continued to prosper for a few more years. They did okay, but things took a dramatic turn. If you know anything about the Apple Computer Company and you've heard anything about one of its founding members, Steve Jobs, you know and have probably heard that he wasn't the easiest guy to get along with. Power struggles and personality conflicts ensued, created, creative differences were introduced, and in 1985, one of the founding members of the company, Steve Wozniak, got so frustrated with where things were going, he just decided to leave. He was like, I've had enough, I'm done. Steve Jobs, in that same year, got on the bad side of his board of directors and was forced to leave. So from 1976, you had this company go great, 
And then in 1985, things started to unravel a little bit. They limped along okay for a few years. They actually made some decent profits for a few years. But in 1997, things had started to decline, and they were facing stiff competition from the IBM PC and Microsoft Windows. And by 1997, the company was actually just a couple of weeks away from bankruptcy. Things had gone from pretty good to pretty bad. And so in 1997, they got a cash infusion from a company called Microsoft, of all people. Um, their, one of their main competitors decided that they would be, um, it'd be easier to have Apple as a competitor than not have them around at all. So they gave them a cash infusion, and then they entered into an agreement to bring Steve Jobs back into the company. Now, those turn of events ultimately led to the creation of a couple of devices that you've probably heard of. The iMac in 1998, the iPod in 2001, the iPhone in 2007, the iPad in 2010, and the iCloud in 2011. Ever heard of any of those things? Maybe have one of those in your pocket this morning? Now, sadly, Steve Jobs passed away in 2011, but the company that he created continued to thrive. And in August of 2020, just last year, the stock of uh, Apple Computer um, hit its high water mark, and the company actually achieved a market capitalization of $2 trillion. It's the first U.S. company ever to have a market capitalization of $2 trillion. And that makes Apple one of the biz biggest business comeback stories of all time. Now, I told you that story so I can tell you this one. While Apple may be the biggest business comeback story of all time, the title of the greatest and biggest comeback story ever belongs to our Lord God. And we're going to discuss that in our um, sermon this morning. But you say, come back from what? God created the heavens and the earth, and in the Old Testament, he makes his covenant with Abraham, and things are just moving along. But as we've been learning about God these past um, seven or eight weeks, we've also learned a great deal about his people. And namely, with his people, what a complete bunch of royal screw-ups they are. Right? Right? While God was ever faithful in keeping his promises to his people, his people were constantly disobeying, complaining, taking things into their own hands, and even turning away from him and worshiping other gods. Total screw-ups. And I'm going to run through this really quick and give you guys an example of this. In the first week of our sermon series, we learned about God the Creator, we learned how he brought the entire world into existence. We learned how God is infinitely large and also how he is infinitely intimate with us at the same time. In Genesis chapter 1, verse 26, God says, let us make mankind in our own image, in our likeness. And the key words there are us and our and they remind us that we worship a triune God, God in three persons, God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit. And that reminds us that Jesus was part of this picture and part of this story from the very beginning. So if we take anything away from the creation story, aside from the fact, of course, that God created everything, it's that Jesus was there from day one, from the very, very beginning. And remember that when we get to the end of this story today. So creation is there, but in spite of living in a perfect relationship with God, in a perfect paradise, Adam and Eve chose to try to live life apart from God by eating from the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. They succumbed to the world's first temptation, and they committed the world's first sin. And we felt the effects of that sin each and every day since. Now, in our second week, we learned about God as a promise keeper, 
We learned about the promise that he made to Abraham, the covenant agreement that he made with Abraham, that he would make him into a great nation and that he would bless him so that he could in turn be a blessing to others and they would be blessed through him. But Abraham and his wife, Sarah, grew impatient waiting for God to make them into a great nation. And so they hatched a plan so that um, at Sarah's urging, Abraham would actually conceive a child with Sarah's slave, Hagar. And, and Hagar conceived a child named Ishmael. Now, God sent an angel to Hagar and told her that Ishmael would also become a great nation. But the hand of Ishmael would be against the hand of everyone else. And everyone else's hand would be against Ishmael's. And he would live in hostility towards all of his brothers. Not good. Sarah immediately regretted what they did and the decision that they'd made. And when God ultimately fulfilled his promise and gave them, Sarah and Abraham, a son, Isaac, Abraham and Sarah sent Hagar and Ishmael packing. And away they went. But in Genesis chapter 5, or 25, verse 18, rather, the Bible tells us that Ishmael's descendants settled near an eastern border of Egypt and that they lived in hostility towards all of the tribes related to them to this day. And many biblical scholars debate whether or not that is the, the pretext for the everlasting conflict in the Middle East. So God makes a promise and Abraham and Sarah took it upon themselves to fulfill that promise. Now, in the third week, as part of God's promise, Abraham uh, was told by God in Genesis this. In Genesis chapter 15, it says, Know for certain that for 400 years your descendants will be strangers in a country not their own, and that they will be enslaved and mistreated there. But I will punish that nation they serve as slaves, and afterwards they will come out with great possessions. So by the time we reach week three in our sermon series, the Israelites had been enslaved in Egypt for over 400 years. God knew that this was going to happen, and at this point we're introduced to God as a rescuer. God brings great suffering down on Egypt, and Pharaoh decides to let the people go. But then Pharaoh changes his mind and sends his army after the Israelites, of course. And God, once again, brings great destruction down on the army of Egypt by separating the Red Sea and allowing the Israelites to pass through and then bringing the waters down on top of them. God rescued them from the army of Pharaoh. But the people grumbled constantly about food and water and they grumbled so much that they said it would have been better if we had just died in Egypt. This is horrible. We want to go back. So God responded to the request for food and water. But then they didn't follow God's instructions about the food and the water. They gathered unto themselves more than God told them to, and it all spoiled. So again, in week three, we see God's responding with faithfulness and the people responding to that faithfulness with selfishness. Now, after God rescues his people from the Egyptians, we were introduced in week four to God, the covenant maker. We learned that a covenant is an unconditional agreement between um, imperfect persons, right? Between God and an imperfect person, rather. And it's motivated by love for that person and nothing else. We also learned that covenant agreements, if they're broken... They include a promise of death. It's a very serious agreement, and it's not to be entered into lightly. The Ten Commandments provided the basis of this covenant agreement, and they dictate how we should live in relationship with God and with others in order to maintain that covenant. And the people of Israel gladly agreed to enter into that covenant agreement with God. But when God called Moses up to the top of Mount Sinai to actually get the written copy of the Ten Commandments on the stone tablets, the people took it upon themselves to build a golden calf. So yet again, we see that God's pursuing a relationship with his people 
while his people are turning their backs on him and actually going so far as to worship other gods and idols. In week five, the people make it to the promised land finally, and we learn about God as a conqueror. God ushers his people into the promised land during the battle of Jericho, and we're reminded that our battles are God's to fight, not ours. And if we choose to serve God, he will fight our life's greatest battles for us. But there were instructions that went out to the people of the Israelites as part of the battle of Jericho. Namely, after you've destroyed the city, you need to destroy a lot of the things that are in it, but then you need to gather up all the gold and the silver and everything that needs to go into the tabernacle. That belongs to me. You're not to take any of that for yourself. But one of the men in the Israelite army, his name was Achan, and he took some of that gold and silver for himself. And so God was very angry again with the Israelites, and he turned his back on them. And so when they moved from the city of Jericho to the city of Ai to fight their next battle, God was not with them, and they were routed, and they were sent packing. Now, once Achan confessed and ultimately was put to death for his sin, God turned back towards the Israelites, and they were back in relationship with each other. But once again, we see God laying things out and fulfilling his promise and the people of Israel doing their own thing. The following week, we learned about how God established the kingdom of Israel. After Joshua passes away, the people are established in Israel. God establishes a kingdom. He creates a theocracy where he will be their God. He will be their king, and all they really need to do is follow him and be obedient to him, and everything will be okay. But the people wanted earthly kings, like some of the neighboring countries around them, and so God granted their request, and he gave them earthly kings. When these kings were obedient to God, Israel prospered. And when these kings were disobedient to God, things started to spiral out of control because God's Holy Spirit was no longer with them. Now, many of these kings were horrible leaders, horrible. And even King Solomon that we all think back and refer to as a great king because he was so wise and so wealthy, by the time his kingship was over, he had begun worshiping other gods, pagan gods, and had turned his back on God himself. After Solomon's death, King Rehoboam was the next king up. And under his tenure, Israel actually split into two kingdoms, the northern kingdom of Israel and the southern kingdom of Judah. So things just keep going from bad to worse for Israel. Now bear with me, because we're almost there. Last week, week seven, we learned about all the prophets that lived during the time of the kings and all the warnings that they spoke to the people of Israel, telling them, get your act together. You guys keep messing up. You are a bunch of screw-ups, and you need to turn around and change your ways. The temple was constructed in Jerusalem in 957 B.C., and within 371 years, it was destroyed God was constantly chasing his people down, telling them that if they avoid suffering by repenting, they could turn back to God and he would be back in relationship with them. God wants us to have an abundant life, and he wants nothing but good for us. So he wants us to follow him. But God's people once again continue to choose to not follow him. They worshiped other gods, and they did things that were detestable to God. So God allowed the northern kingdom of Israel to be overrun by the Assyrians in the year 722 B.C. And the Israelites were actually deported from, from the northern kingdom, and they had to go live in Assyria. And God's patience with the southern kingdom of Judah lasted a little bit longer, but they too eventually had to face God's judgment. 
And so Jerusalem was sacked by the Babylonians in 586 B.C., and that's when the temple was burned to the ground. It was completely destroyed. And this is pretty much that low point for Israel. They've all been deported. The temple's destroyed. So when you look back over the story told throughout the Old Testament, it's kind of hard to not just be completely stunned by Israel's constant disobedience. I mean, what a bunch of losers. What a bunch of complete dunderheads, right? I mean, God keeps laying this out for them, and they just keep turning their back and doing their own thing. And whenever I read the Old Testament before, I was always caught between a feeling of disgust and disbelief. How could they do this? And then thinking about that they did do it, it was just really just kind of disgusting. How could they keep disobeying God? Not once, not twice, but time and time and time and time again. But the more I actually study the Old Testament now, not read it, but study it, the more it's been revealed to me that we are actually just like Israel. We're the dunderheads, right? We are just as idolatrous and self-centered and self-serving as they were, both as individuals and as a nation. And if you don't think that that statement is true, I'm going to give you a couple things to think about this morning. Ask yourself how important any of the following things are to you. Love, power, sex, money, prestige, your career, your home, your car, your comfort, your security, even your family. These are all good things to be sure, but in their, not in their proper perspective. They can become idols for us if we make them a higher priority than God is in our lives. We may not make golden calves, but we pursue idols nonetheless, just like the Israelites did. And if you're not sure if any of these things have become an idol in your life, consider this. Of the 168 hours you have in every week, how many hours do you spend worshiping God and pursuing the things that God would have you do compared to doing your thing and the things that you want to do? Or think about all the money that you make and spend How much of your money is being spent on God's priorities versus your priorities? And you start to see that we look a lot more like the Israelites than we'd like to believe. Now, I personally believe that the reason we differentiate ourselves from the Israelites and look at them like, how could they do this when we would never do that, is because we tend to compress the timeline in the Bible, We tend to read it as a book, and we read the pages in black and white, and so it all just looks very clear to us reading that. It literally is black and white, but it all looks like cause and effect because we scrunch the timeline down together in our heads because we've just read it, and we haven't really studied it. But I believe, and I've come to believe over time as I continue to study the Bible, that the the stories in it actually developed much more gradually and in a much more subtle fashion, almost like the way God interacts with us today. And I'm going to give you a couple examples of that. When Adam and Eve are created in Genesis chapter 2, and then they sin against God in Genesis chapter 3, it's easy for us to assume that the time span between those events was days, maybe weeks, maybe even a month. And maybe they were, but the Bible is silent on that. The Bible gives us no indication whatsoever on how long Adam and Eve actually lived in the Garden of Eden before they were pushed out. So the possibility exists that Adam and Eve were living in the Garden of Eden for years, maybe even decades, before they sinned against God. And suddenly, when you put that into perspective, Year after year after year, tending the garden. How many of us have doing the same thing year after year after year for decades have not asked the question, isn't there more to life than this? 
And suddenly we can see ourselves being Adam and Eve. When you realize that God promised Abraham that he would make him into a great nation at the age of 75, and 10 years later, Abraham still didn't even have a son, we can start to see how we might take things into our own hands as well and push the agenda and figure out a way to have a child for ourselves and maybe even convince ourselves, hey, this is the way God intended this to work out. This is a great idea. God has really made this happen. And we go off and we do our own things and convince ourselves that it's what God intended. And who wouldn't have been concerned about food and water walking through the desert? I would have. I'd been like, hey, where's the water? Where's the food? And given the opportunity to get some food, who wouldn't have gathered as much as you could hold? Even though you were told it's going to spoil, you'll get some more tomorrow. And who wouldn't, after ransacking a city and gathering all of this gold and silver and putting it in the tabernacle, wouldn't be tempted to just grab a couple of coins for yourself and put them in your pockets? What difference would it make? I could really use this. It's not going to affect anybody. And look at our country. When you think about the culture of this nation and how it's changed in the 245 years that it's existed, it suddenly is not so hard to imagine that the great kingdom of Israel and the great temple that was created there could fall to ruins and be destroyed in 370 years. It's not good. So the Bible's not just a story about God and his people. It's also a story about and a warning for us because we are the same stiff-necked, self-serving, dunderheaded people that they were. And without a drastic change, we would face very, very serious consequences. But here's the good news. Thanks for bearing with me. I told you we'd get here eventually. As Jeff mentioned this morning, God is a God of the comeback. Just like Apple Computer came back from the dead, God has a plan to bring all this back. And even while God was in the midst of rebuking the people, sending them into exile away from Israel and from Judah, he was always planning for their restoration. The prophet Elijah and all the major and minor prophets in the Old Testament were were always testifying and pointing to a comeback. A new covenant relationship between God and his people through our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. So hear these words now that um, are spoken from God through his prophet Ezekiel. Just going to give you a couple of examples here. For I will take you out of the nations. I will gather you from all the countries and bring you back into your own land. God's telling them, I'm going to bring you guys back. You know, just I'm going to I'm going to take care of this. I will sprinkle clean water on you and you will be clean. I will cleanse you from all your impurities and from all your idols. I will give you a new heart and put a new spirit in you. I will remove from you your heart of stone and give you a heart of flesh. And I will put my spirit in you and move you to follow my decrees and be careful to keep my laws. So God returns the exiles to Israel and they rebuild the temple. But more importantly, God has a new and better plan for their salvation. Hear how this is spelled out a little bit more in a reading from the prophet Jeremiah. The days are coming, declares the Lord, when I will make a new covenant with the people of Israel and with the people of Judah. It will not be like the covenant I made with their ancestors when I took them by the hand to lead them out of Egypt because they broke my covenant Though I was a husband to them, declares the Lord. This is the covenant I will make with the people of Israel after that time, declares the Lord. I will put my law in their minds. I will write it on their hearts. I will be their God, and they will be my people. No longer will they teach their neighbor or say to one another, Know the Lord, because they will all know me, from the least of them to the greatest, 
declares the Lord. For I will forgive their wickedness and will remember their sins no more. So think about, jumping ahead to the New Testament, think about Jesus confronting the Pharisees, saying, you people, you know the law and you practice the law, but you don't know me in your heart. And so both these readings from Ezekiel and these readings from Jeremiah, they talk about changing people's hearts and offering a forgiveness for their wickedness and remembering their sins no more. The new covenant through Jesus Christ is just laid out constantly throughout the Old Testament. Even as Israel is in the midst of their sin and things are falling apart, God is laying out a better way, a better plan for their salvation. And now hear these very last words of the Old Testament from the book of Malachi, chapter 4, verses 1 through 6. Surely the day is coming. It will burn like a furnace. All the arrogant and every evildoer will be stubble. And the day that is coming will set them on fire, says the Lord Almighty. Not a root or branch will be left to them. But for you who revere my name, the sun of righteousness will rise with healing in its rays. And you will go out and frolic like well-fed calves. Then you will trample on the wicked. They will be ashes under the soles of your feet on the day when I act, says the Lord Almighty. Remember the law of my servant Moses, the decrees and laws I gave him at Horeb for all Israel. See, I will send the prophet Elijah to you before that great and dreadful day of the Lord comes. He will turn the hearts of the parents to their children and the hearts of the children to their parents, or else I will come to the land and strike it with total destruction. Here ends the reading. Now, this seems a little tricky in places, and so I'm just going to take a second and unpack it, because Malachi actually refers to the prophet Elijah in the future tense. I'm going to send Elijah, the prophet Elijah, to you before that great day. And it's like, well, wait a minute. Malachi comes on the scene 400 years after Elijah. So what's going on here? And we don't want to get hung up in this too much, but Elijah is often referred to in the general term for all the prophets. Elijah was a prophet to be sure, but Elijah is also used in that general tense to just refer to the prophet. And so in this specific case, the prophet that they're referring to under that umbrella term of Elijah is John the Baptist, who's going to come and prepare the way for Christ's coming. So Malachi gives us a glimpse into the future. Jesus, just like Moses, provides a glimpse of what it's like to live in a true covenant relationship with God. And Jesus, just like Elijah and all the other prophets, also helps provide a way to guide us back when we stray from the path of righteousness. That was the job of the prophets, to kind of tell people to get it together and come on back. Now, Judgment Day is still coming. That's what Elijah, or Malachi makes very clear. Judgment Day is coming, and no one gets a pass on Judgment Day. But for those who love and serve the Lord with all of their heart, can look forward to that day with hope, knowing that their sins are not going to be held against us. They will be forgiven. If we truly love and serve the Lord, any of our transgressions are going to be wiped clean. So the Old Testament starts with Jesus. Let us make man in our image. Jesus is there at the very beginning of the Old Testament. And the Old Testament ends pointing to Jesus. There's this wonderful thing at the beginning and all this turmoil in the middle. And then it comes right back up to the end. And that's what makes the Bible the greatest comeback story ever. Let us pray. Good and gracious God, we thank you. We thank you that you are a God that is so wonderful and so amazing. So many layers and dimensions, but you are the one true God, Lord. And we thank you for revealing yourself to us. 
Lord, we just pray that you will forgive us for all of the ways that we fall short. We are so sorry, Lord, for the way that you constantly pursue us and we constantly turn our backs on you, that we constantly put other things before you in our daily lives. We pray that you will forgive us for our hard-heartedness and our self-concern when you do nothing but give and give and give. Lord, we thank you that in spite of our stubbornness, you have created a plan, a new covenant through your son, Jesus Christ, who came to earth to wipe our slate clean, to make the sacrifice that was required for the old covenant that was broken and form the basis of the new covenant based on love and grace and forgiveness. Lord, we pray that as your children, we will be truly changed in our hearts, that we will love you and serve you with all of our heart and our mind and our soul and our strength. so that others can be a blessing and be blessed because we were first blessed and offer blessings to them. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer.